about that. Um, and then if anyone misses this or if you have to leave, you can watch it on YouTube. All right, gonna add Natalie. <clears throat> Natalie, how's it going? Hey, good, how are you? Doing great, welcome to the Next Gen uh, so, uh, Planning uh, community, community with uh, for the state of Michigan. Although I say that very loosely given I'm in California, we have people in Virginia, we have folks from Washington, uh, we are all over the state. So it's pretty much anyone that this is just the cool kid group of next gen association and next gen com uh, community. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be with you. That's great. And you're over in Santa Barbara, right? Just north of me. Nice. That's beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah, it's awesome. Any any wineries or any uh, places we got to plug here? Shout out for Santa Barbara. <laughs> Um, I mean, Santa Barbara is so lovely to visit. I don't drink, um, so I, <laughs> but we do have great wine here, um, great downtown, and yeah, it's a super fun place to visit. Awesome. Well, one of the things, Natalie, I want to start out with, because we got all these letters behind our names, there's some college students in here, most advisors are in their first like five to ten, a few of us starting to get a little bit beyond, including myself. Uh, but when we look at designations, uh, we're looking at CFP seems to be such a popular one. Um, you know, CFA is another popular one. But you have this one, uh, the Behavioral Financial Advisor, BFA. Mm -hmm. What is that designation all about? Just kind of jumping off uh, to, to get the, the party started here. Sure. Um, yeah, so the Behavioral Financial Advisor designation um, was created by um, Doug Lenick and Chuck Wackendorfer. Um, so they have uh, old American Express Financial Advisors Ameriprise roots, um, and that's where I started my career in 2004. So I knew Doug um, from way back, and um, so so that's how I knew, and and that's when I initially was um, exposed to like the idea of core values and how that works in personal finances, and um, so I was learning those things from him at Ameriprise 15 years ago, and then. Um, they've developed a company, Think to Perform, a coaching company. They work with people within our industry and externally as well. Um, and they created the Behavioral Financial Advisor designation. And so, um, so that's what that designation is. It's focused on the decision-making process. Um, so how to make better decisions, um, which I find is really useful. So that's what it is. And, and that's where to find it. Love it. And what would you kind of compare if you're familiar maybe with like George Kinder's work with financial life planning, mm -hmm. um, where where would those maybe start to overlap or contrast? Are they totally different? Because I know that's another popular designation that that gets a lot of, of uh, talk and popularity. Yeah, I would say that they're fairly different animals, not that there's not a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the behavioral financial advisor designation is going to give more um, tools and context around um, how to have, it's sort of like more like EQ type stuff, um, mm -hmm. which I guess you could say life planning. There's a lot of that as well. Um, but I think George's approach with life planning is more about, um, I don't know, it's, it's more, it's like deeper and more spiritual, to be honest. Like it has deeper roots in it. Um, then I think the behavioral financial advisor, I think the behavioral financial advisor designation coursework is more like tangible strategies of do mm -hmm. this exercise and talk through these things. And when somebody's, you know, hitting a decision making moment, like, okay, the, there's a certainty of uncertainty. And so what are the things that you can do to help the client in this moment? And so I think it's maybe more tangible, whereas life planning, not that it doesn't have extremely tangible application, um, the coursework itself is maybe less tangible and at a higher level than the, the BFA. Gotcha. So the BFA, we're coming to maybe more uh, conclusive decisions. The financial life planning, we're maybe getting a little bit more spiritual or thinking a little bit more of just kind of your, your life in general and maybe big picture of why we're here uh, right. conversation. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they're both phenomenal. Um, but, but yeah, I'd, I'd say they're different in that way. Awesome. Uh, shout out to Matt here on the quick question here, similar to where I just jumped into. Uh, and then the other popular designation would be certified financial therapist. Mm -hmm. Have you ever ha had any uh, conversation or any experience with, with that designation or have heard of maybe how that would compare and contrast? Yeah, great question. Financial therapy and um, the CFT is also a phenomenal designation. It's going to take more work to get there. So the, the BFA, I think, is the least expensive and the quickest to accomplish of the three. Mm -hmm. uh, life planner, um, it's going to cost you 10 grand plus and, and many days of your, you know, um, of your week to go travel and do some stuff in person. They do some remote as well. It's a phenomenal program. It's certainly worth it, but the price point is much higher. Um, the CFT um, is going to involve more coursework than the BFA. And the CFT, um, I mean, yeah, it has, it has, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of like specifics on what would be different about that one versus the BFA. I did not um, prepare you for these designations. No, it's okay. I know. I, I didn't know what you're talking about this, but um, <laughs> I think the breadth is, is um, there's going to be more breadth in certified financial therapy and the behavioral one is like, you're not, you're not dealing with money scripts. You're not dealing with um, like, how did you grow up with money kind of stuff necessarily, where I think in financial therapy, you would deal with more of those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, which money scripts do you adhere to? What does that mean for how you handle money? Um, and I don't know what the FFC is, financial fitness. I've not heard of that, Miriam. So you can you can let me know if you find out, but I don't I don't know that designation. Sorry, I'm not some designation expert. I was just. I, was just... <laughs> I, I actually threw you completely into the deep end here. Oh, I'm happy to talk about anything. I just want to be clear <laughs> when I when it's not my subject matter expertise. So. Absolutely, probably worth though backing up. Um, I'm a big fan of your work. You've actually were uh, a major uh, request here from a lot of the people that continue to come to, to our meetups here. Um, so maybe we could start off, you mentioned starting a career or at least spending quite a bit of time at Ameriprise, but uh, how did you get into the business? Did you know you wanted to be a financial uh, planner and even be in consulting? You've had some really interesting fintech experience working with like uh, LearnVest and uh, LVest and a few others and continuing to now pursue uh, another fintech product with Monarch. Mm -hmm. Where did all this come about? Did you know you wanted to be into fintech and financial planning? Yeah, good question. Um, so the real story uh, is that I did not know what I wanted to be when I wanted to grow. When I, when I grew up, I, I was a waitress after college and couldn't find a job. Um, it was 2003, so it was after the burst of the tech bubble. Um, and it was a really challenging time. And it was just, I mean, this is going to really age me. I'm 41. But um, it was around the time that like applying for a job became a digital thing and not an in-person thing. So mm -hmm. it felt like odd to not, it felt like really unseen. It was like, well, I don't go into the place to get the job anymore, but like finding a job digitally was still pretty challenging. And so um, I did not know what I wanted to do. I went to an American Express financial advisor. So they ultimately spin off, spun off from American Express and became Ameriprise. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to an information session because my older sister's college roommate was an Ameripri American Express advisor and said, you should try this. I know you can't find a job. You should try this. So that's how I did. I started, I made minimum wage, which at the time was 675 an hour. Um, we were required to work more than 55 hours a week, but we were only allowed to report 55 hours a week. I think they've since changed that practice, which is good. Yeah. Um, we had phone clinics. Um, so you know, I, I passed the math test. They hired me. I passed my, uh, you know, my uh, licensing exams. And um, there was like three hour phone clinics, Monday nights, Thursday mornings, Saturdays, nine to one. And we had to smile and dial. Um, and that's, that's how I came into the business. And four and a half months into that said, this is not who I am. And this is not how I want to do business. However, I really love this financial planning thing. I really see the power of being able to help people with their finances and the impact that you can have. I just would like to know what I'm doing um, and would like to not have to do this super salesy thing. So 
Um, so I left really quickly after four and a half months, my older sister, who was a recruiter at the time in the Bay area was like, don't leave your first job, your first grown up job after four and a half months, you dummy, you know, like you got to stay for a year. And I was like, no, I, I really can't stay here for a year. Um, so I found, uh, um, Ameriprise practice on their P2 channel. So that means it was a franchise owner. So they had their own kind of their own practice could do much more of their own thing. And um, I was mentored by him, um, Neil Littlejohn. And um, that was such a gift. I learned so much from him and he created an environment where I could learn myself. Um, so not only did I learn a ton from him, but I was able to like seek the knowledge that I wanted. You know, he didn't pay for my CFP. I paid for my CFP. Um, but it gave me access. It gave me access to Ameriprise's resources and it gave me access to wholesaler resources, um, which gosh, I haven't met with a wholesaler in a decade. But at that time, you know, that that was a lot of the way that we would access resources to learn and grow and um, figure out how to run our practices more efficiently and how to serve different demographics of clients, um, estate planning strategies, all that kind of stuff. A lot of it actually came through wholesalers. So, um, so that environment was really um, key for me. And I will say that, um, Neil was also a black gentleman. Um, and for me being a young woman in the industry who looked about 14, it was such a gift to have my mentor be someone who also didn't look like the standard financial advisor. And, um, that was really empowering for me, I think in ways that I didn't understand at the time. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's how I started. And then I, was serving pre-retired people, really wanted to help people in my own decade. I was in my 20s. Um, and so I started looking into how could I use technology? This was back in like 2011. How could I use technology to serve people more efficiently yeah. um, at a lower price point to make it more accessible? And so that's ultimately in doing research for that project, because um, my husband and an engineer and I were going to found a company. In doing research for that project, I found Learn Best. And they were on that same mission and they were further ahead than I was. And so I joined Learn Best and had a phenomenal experience there. And then kind of ever since had I've, I've to some extent split myself between my RAA that I launched two and a half years ago and consulting in the fintech space. Sorry if that was a really long answer. That was <laughs> exactly. Years, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is exactly <laughs> what we're looking for. And I'll definitely want to kind of go back into, you know, where you are today and some of the stuff that you're currently working on. Um, but one thing I wanted to kind of pause and that jumped out, especially given that there's a lot of young people who are either in college or new to the profession on the call here and going to be watching this. Mm -hmm. When you said that you got into the industry and it was smile and dial, kind of interesting, like even when I graduated from college in 2015, my first experience was at a large insurance company, kind of smiling and dialing. And it didn't change a whole lot. I think I probably wasn't nearly as resourceful as a lot of great uh, students are today, but it feels like it's starting to shift and kind of curious your thoughts. And, and even like if you're talking with young people or if you have any vision on that, like what would be um, your maybe recommendation to adv uh, younger advisors trying to get into the industry if they if that's really just the best way to do it? or if you feel like there's almost just this kind of this awkward gap in getting into a advisory practice that does real planning, kind of like what you were mentioning and, and even talking about behavioral planning instead of just selling products. Mm -hmm. What is a young person to do? They just have to kind of grit their teeth, smile and dial, and that's the way to get in? Good question. I don't think that's the only way to get into the industry anymore, which I'm very glad about. Um, at LearnVest, we home grew um, more than 30 financial planners um, that many of them were like uh, barista or Uber driver to um, to CFP. Um, and, and that was a big part of um, what ended up being our mission at LearnVest. Hi, Jody. Hi, Jody. Um, and that Sorry. team, no worries. That team has gone on, you know, the, the people that we trained up at LearnVest have gone on and they're all over FinTech now, um, which is really rewarding and really cool to see. And some of them have started practices. I mean, they're all over financial services, but um, but more on the leading edge because of the experience we had at LearnVest. So I think there's, you don't have to smile and dial anymore, which I think is such a gift. 
Um, if I were brand new in the industry today, um, there were also not like, I couldn't go to school for financial planning. That wasn't a thing um, when I went to college. And so, cause I started college in the late nineties. Um, I'm really gonna age myself. That's okay. You already know how old I am. Um, <laughs> we're here so, for. So yeah, so I, I would say like becoming a para planner, getting a para planner role or an associate role at a firm that you think is as aligned as it could be with people you're interested in serving and a service model that you're, you know, or, or a fee model that you feel good about. Um, and supporting that practice, I think you'll learn a ton. Um, what you learn about what you don't want to do is just as valuable as what you learn about what you do want to do. Um, so that's how I would start if I was going to do it now is I would find a paraplanner or associate or entry level role at a larger firm and find some mentor advisors that you look up to that you respect and learn from them, ask them questions and um, learn through casework. I mean, the stuff that I did in, in seven or eight years at Ameriprise, you know, I didn't really understand disability insurance and um, coordination of policies. Mm -hmm. until I had a client who he was a dentist and they had gotten taken advantage of by an insurance broker and they had multiple disability policies that actually coordinated with one another and overlapped. And oh, so they yeah. wouldn't actually all pay out. They wouldn't stack on top of each other. They would just say, oh, well, that policy is paying five grand. So we'll only pay the extra thousand kind of thing. Um, that That's when like I really learned about disability insurance because I read every single policy that they owned. And so I think the exposure to casework, even if it's not your ideal client, or if it's not your ideal practice, um, is a tremendous learning opportunity that there's, there's really, it's such an important complement to mm. book knowledge, whether it's a um, undergrad program or a grad program or the CFP um, content, that casework is really when it comes to life. And having to go through so many stinking annuities that had all sorts of weird living benefits and death benefits. And like, it wasn't until I had clients, you know, walk in the door that I had to figure that stuff out for them and be able to explain to them what they had and then discern, is this appropriate for you? And if not, what would be? Um, that's, that's like when I think a lot of my knowledge really solidified from a financial planning perspective. Um, so I would be looking to get exposure to casework. And what would you say to a young person who's maybe listening to you right now going, oh my gosh, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm getting overwhelmed just thinking about this. What's what's kind of your, your uh, word of calming advice or go study or kind of it's okay to learn on the job? What, what do we tell young people getting into the profession? Overwhelmed by the like subject matter um, expertise or overwhelmed by overwhelmed by what? Maybe by learning the, yeah, the subject matter expertise, I think. Mm. Um, I mean, I had no, I, I happened to be a, a double major in economics and sociology, but I, other than my econ major, I had no background in anything personal finance and, um, but, but I, but I'm, I'm pretty good at math. <laughs> and so yeah. that, that helped, right? Like I have a good number since, yeah. um, I was a math major actually before I was an econ major. My sister was like, that's too narrow. Don't do that. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I didn't know anything about insurance. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of being in a practice where you can study under somebody and mm -hmm. be mentored, um, that you have a safe place to ask questions and you have an opportunity to learn and grow. And I think it takes some, um, some like self-motivation, um, especially because our industry is made up of ultimately a lot of small businesses, even with your, when you're with a big firm, you're right. likely sort of like a small business with inside of a big firm, if you're not just a small business completely. Right. And so I think um, like taking the lead and saying, I have the opportunity to learn. I'm not expecting someone to be my teacher. I just need an environment that's conducive to learning and being willing to sort of, um, find the learning opportunities yourself, either going through coursework or getting designations or taking a class or, um, you know, Kitsis webinars, or if you're interested in equity comp, going through um, mystockoptions.com, all of their coursework, you can find the knowledge. So I think not relying too much on that mentor advisor or on that firm to just like you receive and they give, 
-hmm. but rather you're just looking for an environment where you can go pursue knowing what you want to know and that you have it available to you rather than thinking of they're going to teach and I'm going to learn and I'm just going to sit back and let them take me through the course. Um, So, yeah. So it's kind of like what you said of like getting yourself into an environment where you have access to a mentor. Maybe you are in a pair planning, pair planning role, but when you come across these opportunities to learn, lean into it, be curious and kind of follow that curiosity, do your best to be resourceful and, uh, and, and maybe run what you thought was going to be the right answer past your mentors. That feels like it's probably going to be an even better learning opportunity for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So Natalie, where are you today in your business and consulting? What does kind of the practice look like? What's, uh, what is the, the overall, I know you mentioned it's kind of barbell between consulting and, and planning. That's a little bit unusual. What, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah I, I, have, I have two loves. Um, so one of them is breadth of impact and one of them is depth of impact. Um, so FinTech gives me the opportunity to have broad impact, right? Like I can, um, create technology that then serves millions of people, um, never in a private practice, no matter how big could I ever serve millions of people. Um, but the, but you, you kind of take a hit on depth, um, with technology, um, and being in private practice allows me to have a depth of impact with clients working one-on-one or training other advisors to work one-on-one that is also like just very meaningful to me. Um, So I think I will probably always have a flavor of both in my work life, in my career from from now on. Um, But I do anticipate that the the mix will shift over time depending on what opportunities are available or where I'm leaning. So right now I'm roughly split split 50-50 between my practice and my work as head of advice at Monarch Money. but that may shift, you know, if the practice needs more of me, or if I have opportunities on that side, I may need to shift on the monarch side. Um, and I don't know that I can go less than 50% in my practice ever. Um, who knows, yeah. but, um, but yeah, so I, I anticipate that that will, will shift and evolve and uh, continue to over time. But, um, in terms of what my practice looks like, um, I launched an RAA in early 2020. Um, I started from scratch and um, I serve people in their thirties and early forties with young families uh, or who wanna start families who have um, significant amounts of equity compensation through their employers. Mm -hmm. So incentive stock options, non-qualified stock options, RSUs, um, ESPP to a lesser extent. Um, Many of my clients work for private companies that are pre-IPO. And some of them work for public companies like Google and Amazon. Um, but many of them work for private um, tech companies. And so that's that's my my niche. Um, all of my clients, uh, virtually all of my clients, I'll say 95% of them fall into that niche. Yeah. Um, and so I spent a lot of time over the last two and a half years um, deepening my knowledge specifically on equity compensation. Um, it's fascinating to me and I love learning about it. And so I dedicate you know, a a certain number of hours every single week to like improving my knowledge base on equity comp, Um, reading, taking courses, taking classes. I'm TAing a class for a friend who's teaching about equity comp, Um, but I'm still learning. I mean, that's sort of what's fun about what we do. Um, I would say in the beginning, in the first part of my career, I thought that I'd get to a point where I knew the things. Um, And I think then I got to the point where I said, where I realized like, I'll never know all the things, but I'm really confident saying to a client, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, I would love to get the answer to you, for, for you, um, and that that's okay. Um, because like legitimately there are just new things to learn all the time. So I think having a learner's mindset is really important regardless of where you are in your career journey um, in financial planning, especially because there just is always new stuff. Um, so yeah. yeah. That really hit home being willing to say that you don't know the answer we're going to get back. Um, we were just talking about that before you got on the call here. Um, mm-hmm. We have a social hour with just the, the community for the first hour. And that was a big topic with an advisor that recently started a firm and they're being kind of launched into a lead advisory role, maybe a little earlier than they expected. 
And just having the power and the confidence to say, great question. I don't know. Let me get back to you. Mm -hmm. Anyone listening, Natalie is an expert and she is still saying that. So that is, <laughs> if that, you know, that is awesome. A um, couple of really good comments on here. Uh, second, uh, Matt saying, you know, really well said that you have a passion for depth versus uh, versus breadth. Like that's uh, really well said. I love kind of that idea. And that also hits home with me trying to like do this and post to YouTube and trying to help as many advisors as possible. Um, but then still being able to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations, kind of hitting on both of those. So I love that. Um, and then Stephanie, I wonder, do you want to come off mute and maybe ask the question about advice to maybe get started in a role in fintech? It feels like maybe there's a little bit more behind that. Yeah, I mean, I own my own RA too, but I just love fintech and I'm always fascinated by it. But it all like, how what advice do you have from the advisor side of getting into that? Um, I don't know. I'd love to find a, a side hustle to mm. somehow get involved with that. And yeah, good question. I mean, I think um, as a so so there's lots of areas of fintech. So we talk about fintech, but it's like an umbrella term like insurance, right? There's so many different types of insurance within that umbrella. Um, and so fintech too has a tremendous amount of things um, within it. Um, many of which I have no interest in at all, like payments and fraud protection. I don't care about that stuff at all. <laughs> I'm glad that other people do, right? But like, I don't care about that stuff. Um, so there's advisor tech, right? So like all the tech that we use, all the resources that we have available to us to choose from as advisors. Um, and then there's consumer facing, um, like there's robo advisors, which are one area of fintech. And then there's PFM, so personal financial management tools. Um there's budgeting apps. There's there's so many different areas of fintech. So I think if it's a passion of yours, then I think knowing where where specifically is that passion, like what about it do you love? Um, and then understanding, I don't know, do you have a background in like working in tech at all? Not at all. We, not in tech, no. My formal, like I went to school to be a CFP, but we brought on Salesforce with Solentica and I was uh -huh. like the lead on that project. And I made workflows and created it and designed everything. So I like dabbled my toe in it. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't have the time to do it full time, but it just, I love testing things and giving feedback and it, you know, like I said, I can't commit full time, but there, it feels like there should be something where, Hey, you know, money guide pro needs help with a project, but like, how do you find those opportunities? Yeah, so I think it's a little bit about knowing what type of work you might want to do within fintech. So, um, like one of the things is being an advisor for a fintech company. So, being a financial advisor for a fintech company, and there are companies like Origin. My friend um, David Blaylock, who's another Learn Best alum, uh, I work there too. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Dave, David runs planning over there. Um, so that's a side hustle opportunity that's kind of straight up the alley of I'm going to do I'm going to do advisor work, but I'm going to do it in a fin in a fintech space. Um, yeah. My friend Chris Pimpo, who is another Learn Best alum, is head of advice or head of planning over at Northstar, um, and and they're hiring CFPs. Um, Facet, which we all know, right? They're hiring CFPs. So there's doing the work of an advisor, but in a fintech environment, um, and then there's actually developing, helping to develop the technology, um, and. So one of the roles is to be a subject matter expert or a SME, um, and a SME would work together with a product manager, a designer, and an engineering team to inform the product. Um, so if it's a, you know, like at Monarch building financial planning software that's direct to consumer, um, some of the things that I do as a SME there is help the team understand where in the decision making process would the would the user be in this moment and what is the most important information and context for them to have in front of them when they're thinking through this moment of their journey um or you know where do we need to be absolutely exact about things and where do we need to be directionally correct or what other considerations should we have on our mind or um what data do we need to be able to give advice on this topic so those are more like SME sort of things and then there's being a beta tester, right? So like if you want to try a new feature, um, that's something I don't know that you'll really get paid for it necessarily, but um, but being able to be part of a beta with a new, um, either a new software rollout or a new software period 
um, that's a way that you can have feedback um, and work with the user experience team, the UX team, to give feedback and perspective on what it's like to be a user of that software. Um, so there's all kinds of different roles. I think it just kind of depends. And then there's content, right? So a lot of fintechs need great writers. Um, so if you're a great writer and you want to write about personal finance, then partnering up with a fintech company and being able to write for them um, could be a great way to, to be a part of fintech. So I think it, I, I hope that helps a little bit, Stephanie, but um, but it depends quite a bit on what your skill set is and what your desires are and then where in fintech you're actually interested in getting involved. No, that's great. Thank you. Sticking on that topic, and then Kimberly, I want to get to your question. What does your role like look like, Natalie, in, in that context of being a consultant to Monarch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am. Uh, I'm not a consultant to Monarch. I'm actually part of the team. Um, I've been a consultant ever since I left LearnVest for every other um, fintech company I've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, but Monarch, I I'm actually in house with them. Um, and the work there is one of the core things that I did there is, is write their financial advice methodology. And I've done that at multiple fintechs before. I did it at LearnVest with a small team. Um, I've done it at, at multiple other um, fintechs at LearnLux and, um, and others. Uh, and financial advice methodology, it's not from a technical standpoint, it's not actually methodology, but it's the easiest way to describe it. Um, but it's what actually is our advice and how does all the advice work together, right? So do we say that you should do a debt snowball or a debt avalanche, or could you choose based on whatever, you know, factors and what are those factors and what names do we use for things? Do we call it take home pay or do we call it net income or do we call it paycheck? Mm -hmm. um, do we recommend that you pay off your credit card debt first or that you build some emergency fund and then go back to credit card debt and then go back to emergency fund? Like, is it a emergency fund donut with credit card debt in the middle, um, all of that stuff. And, and how do we prioritize across different areas of your finances, right? Is debt payoff more important than uh, investing versus saving? And when do you do which one? And how do you discern if where the next dollar goes? So financial advice methodology is all of that stuff. So there's the nuts and bolts financial advice part of it. And then there's the behavioral overlay of, you know, maybe optimally, uh, from a number standpoint, we would say, get your match in your 401k and then go elsewhere to invest. And then if you have, you know, do your, whatever, Roth IRA, and then go back to your 401k. But from a behavioral standpoint, the number of people that are going to do that 401k, Roth IRA, 401k donut, um, they may not implement, right? So from a behavioral standpoint, it may be better for the advice methodology to just be like, max out your 401k. It's easy. It's how, you know, it comes out of your paycheck. And so, having the behavioral overlay of the advice is part of the methodology as well. So that's part of what I do at Monarch. Um, and then working as a SME, so working with the product design and engineering teams on the actual development of the software. So everything from what are the calculations underlying it from an advice perspective? How are we calculating retirement? How are we handling tax brackets here? How do we determine whether it's Roth or traditional here? Um, to how does the page look? For the user what's missing what needs to be where mm -hmm. um, and then content um so helping with content as well lining up freelance writers helping with which topics we write about what we write about them um, making sure that's in alignment with our advice methodology as a whole so that everything se feels seamless for the user across the experience wow that is awesome i got some really good visualizations when you're describing like the uh donut method of building the emergency fund and paying down the credit card um uh -huh. i know that you famously uh, mentioned like uh, having less deliverables in your plans and trying to be more mm -hmm. uh, visual with your clients. Um, I can definitely see that starting to already pop out, like as you were just describing that, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't use deliverables in my. Um, I don't use any. I actually don't use planning software. I'm not recommending to you that you don't use planning software. I just I've built financial planning software a couple times in my career, and so. I don't personally use planning software, but it's not because planning software isn't great. Um, but I build my own deliverables for clients. And I would say that in the first eight years of my career in traditional private practice, it was like, okay, I'm a CFP and I've got this. I was using FASWARE. That's so old. No one will know what that is. But, you know, the 125 page financial plans. And um, 
and it was like just so much it was it was just vast and i think part of that was like proving the value of the planning of like mm -hmm. this is the deliverable this is the tangible value this is what i'm delivering mm -hmm. um and then going into fintech it was like you have to fight for every single piece of data that you want so do you really need the person's last name do you need their birth date or just their age and why right mm -hmm. you have to fight for every piece of data that you're going to build into something from a from a tech standpoint and so it's more of a start from nothing mentality and where can I have the most impact in the least amount of time with the least amount of data and the least amount of money. Um, and so translating that into my private practice, I have very pared down visuals and deliverables that I use with clients that I designed to just facilitate the kind of conversation and decision-making that they need to have in that moment. So anyway. There was a really great quote and I had it prepared and now I lost it, but it went something along like this, like perfection is not when everything is added, but when there's nothing left that you can take away. Mm -hmm. And I kind of get that sense of like the minimalistic, less is more, let's actually implement because we could have this thousand step perfect financial plan in a spreadsheet, but if you don't implement it, what good is it? And there's a lot of really great research about how much planning, how much advice is actually being implemented from advisor to client. That's right. Yep. Yeah. All right. I got to get over to, sorry, Kimberly. I think we could have ranted like all day about <laughs> these different topics here, but uh, Kimberly, you want to ask uh, your question on equity count? Yeah, it's a quick one. You said that you're constantly learning about um, employer equity. So I was wondering, you know, what resources do you recommend mm -hmm. other than mystockoptions.com? I'm familiar with that. But I work for Origin too, and it's oh, been, cool. um, I mean, I've loved learning, but I, I just feel like I need to learn more about the employer equity side of things. Yeah. So there's a great book by um, Kay Thomas, Consider Your, I think it's called Consider Your Options. There's actually two versions of it. One is for advisors and one is for consumers. And I think the one called Consider Your Options, it's, um, it's in my bedside table, but I haven't pulled it out in a while. Um, but that one is like, I would start with the consumer facing one. He do, does a great job of explaining a lot of, a lot of things. Um, so I would say that is a, is a phenomenal resource for you as well. There are other books um, to read as well. And if anybody's part of the XYPN Facebook group, um, there are threads of, of more book titles. I don't want to overwhelm you at this moment, but I would say that book is the place that I would start. Um, and then on mystockoptions.com specifically, their content is not um, super well organized and a lot of it repeats. And sometimes it's a amalgamation of Q and A stuff from different places, but they do have the learning center inside of mystockoptions.com, which I don't know if you've been there and it will walk you through different modules, um, like a, a, a um, curated path user journey of <clears throat> learning about different topics and reading different articles in a certain order. And I would, I find that helpful. And you can always skip through the ones that you already um, understand really well. But I would say the learning center specifically on mystockoptions.com is really helpful um, because it'll, it'll give you like a, a curated journey through the content um, that will help you build your knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then if you're really into equity comp and you're like already somewhat well-versed, um, my friend, Russell Kroger, um, has a course and, um, I'm, I'm TAing for him right now in the current cohort, which is all women. The, the current cohort mm -hmm. is all women, which is pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. I'm almost never in an all women group unless it's like a women's group. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, anyway, but, um, but that's another really good one. Um, but okay. I will say like, that's not a beginner's course. It's like a, you already know some stuff and you're looking to go to the next level. Uh, Russell will blow your mind. Okay. What's his last name? Kroger, K-R-O-E-G-E-R. -E -E okay. He works at Upstart Wealth Management. That's his firm with um, his partner, Mike. Um, but yeah, he has an equity comp course and it's phenomenal. Okay. Thanks. Yep. I put the link to the book in the chat and a link to Russell Kroger's website okay. if anyone is interested. All right. I can't let you get off the hook, Natalie, without double clicking on not using planning software oh, yeah. within your firm. 
what what is what does that look like uh, in maybe more detail? And maybe how does that contrast even with some of the advice you might be giving to financial planning software, right? That seems uh, almost contradictory, but I'm guessing you can make the connection. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. One is I work with a really specific demographic. So I'm not doing a lot of estate planning numbers. Um, I'm not doing a lot of retirement income numbers. I'm not doing any um, because my clients are in their 30s and early 40s. Um, so the the kinds of things that I'm asking of planning software, um, and most of my clients have some debt, um, mostly mortgages and auto loans, but you know, occasionally debt outside of those student loans or credit card debt. Um, and there are some of the, you know, of the top three planning softwares, one of them doesn't even allow you to put in any debt. <laughs> um, a, there is no like debt module, there is no debt goal in it, right? So um, I think that some of the planning software was built for a demographic that's different than the one that I serve. Um, Jamie, I think it's e it's either eMoney or Money Guide Pro, um, but I think I want to say it's eMoney. Um, I check in every now and then to see and do a, I, I do a, um, uh, demo with them. And anyway, yeah, probably Money Guide Pro. I don't know. Um, anyway, so, and none of them do a great job with equity comp. And I do so much, like equity comp is where I'm going deep in the weeds, right? And so none of them do a great job with equity comp. And so um, for me, there isn't a planning software that is ideal for my clients. However, if I was in your shoes, meaning not almost 20 years into the business, I would absolutely be using planning software. I think it's a great, yes, Google Sheets. I use, yeah. Um, but I would absolutely be using planning software. I think it's, I think there's a lot of value in it. I think it helps you see lots of different variables. I think because I've built planning software a couple of times, I know what happens behind it. I know what the spreadsheet looks like behind it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so then I just have the spreadsheet because I can manipulate the spreadsheet um, much more quickly and I can run 10 scenarios in my spreadsheet in 10 minutes versus running 10 scenarios by changing the data set and then going back into the whatever in the other part of the software. Um, it's just a lot of hassle for me. So I say it cautiously just because I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to somebody. I wouldn't recommend it to myself five years into the industry. Um, I would say use planning software, but um, because of where I am and the experience that I've had and the people that I serve, I find that planning software isn't additive to the experience. And for me, I try to run a really impact first, efficient practice because the more efficient I can keep things, the more people I can serve and the more reasonable I can keep my fees. Um, so, yeah. Full disclosure, I do almost the exact same thing. All of my planning, maybe 95% of it is in Google Sheets and have built out my own modules that way. And it, I've been doing that for about three, four years now. And now the template is to the point that it all flows together as well. And then you can just simply just duplicate the whole thing and name that the home purchase scenario to your point. And it's like, okay, how does that impact cash flow? And then boom, it flows right through the whole thing. And you can just stay hyper efficient if you've already done and banged your head against the wall with an e-money plan for yeah. the five years prior. <laughs> Well, and I think that working with one specific niche also really helps there. Like not only does my niche not really need the estate planning and retirement income stuff, but every client has the same set of variables and the same set of considerations. And so mm -hmm. I don't have to have a spreadsheet that can handle a 65 year old trying to optimize for social security and when to take so it. Through. I don't, cause I don't serve those clients. I only serve my niche. And so it allows me to go deeper um, more quickly in, in my own tools. So it looks like Matt has a question. Um, where did I learn to develop my own software um, and any resources to not have to start from scratch? Okay, I'm also not recommending that you go develop your own software. So I am not a developer. Um, and, uh, but I can talk to them, <laughs> um, but I'm not a developer. Um, and the, re the so I learned to develop software because that was part of what my role was at um, learn best. So that's where that started. And I was not the engineer. So I was not the developer. I was not the product manager. I was a SME. Um, but as a SME, and I actually ran a team of SMEs, SME being subject matter expert that works with product manager, designer, and engineering team. I ran a team, we called it advice strategy. Um, and 
we were the SMEs for the build of the planning software. There was the client experience and the advisor experience and the inputs and the calculations and all the parts of the software. Our team was embedded with each of those parts. Um, so, so that's where I started, Matt. Um, and then any, any resources to not have to start from scratch? Good question. I feel like Right Capital is building a pretty darn good software. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with them. They seem, it seems relatively efficient and logical and rational. And um, it depends on what demographic you're serving, right? It's not the perfect fit for every demographic, but I think there's definitely more and more tools available. I think for the big companies that make planning software, um, they have so many so many embedded partnerships and customization that it's very challenging for them to do something wholly new. Yeah. Um, but but I do see them trying and I do appreciate that. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's a good enough question. And then Jamie, do I have spreadsheets to analyze how much life insurance someone needs? Yes, I do. So the way I look at life insurance is uh, I run a year by year analysis of every year from now until age 100. Um, of the survivor and the spreadsheet has all the stuff that if you went to right capital and went to the cash flows tab or really money guide pro or e-money and went to the like what's the numbers behind it tab um, it's a spreadsheet that looks exactly like that so for me it's all of the expense sources so um, if mortgage if debt is paid off then there's not an expense source of, of debt um, but there's expenses so living expenses those inflate over time and then there's um, oftentimes extra childcare. So if a partner, you know, many of my my clients have young families, and so we add childcare if something were to happen. And then in terms of income sources, I always give the surviving partner a year off, um, and then they let me know whether they want to go back to work or not. Typically they do, but we plan for a year off and then going back to work. And usually if they're high earners, we kind of step into that high earning over five years. Um, and then we have social security benefits um, for the like minor aged children because um, those will kick in up to the family max. So we have all the income sources year by year by year by year. And then I and then we have their um, assets and I solve for like how much money needs to be in this bucket today to not run out at 100. Right. So um, that that is what my spreadsheet looks like. I know I, I was like talking my hands a lot, but like that's what my spreadsheet looks like is every year of columns of expenses and every year of columns of income and every year of columns of, you know, starting investment balance, spend out of the investments um, based on, you know, income minus expenses. If there's a differential, then it comes out of the investment account, right? Um, rate of return um, and then an ending balance. And that sort of cycles through every year. So that's what my spreadsheet looks like. So that's how I figure out that piece of life insurance. And then I add to that um, paying off debt. So if they've got a million dollars on a mortgage, then we're going to pay off the mortgage. Um, I add a fully funded emergency fund. I add fully funded college um, for my clients. Um, and then I take away from that any existing life insurance and any existing assets that would be available to meet those goals. So if they need 60,000 in emergency fund and they have 60,000 in emergency fund, then that nets to zero. If they need 200,000 for college and they have 200,000 for college, that nets to zero. If they need 2 million in that long spreadsheet I did and they have a million, then the difference is only a million that they would need to make up with life insurance. So that was real deep in the weeds. I hope that made sense. But yeah, that made sense. Okay. I am an engineer in a past life and now I'm a financial oh, planner and right cap. Yeah, I have been having so much fun with automations to minimize the efficiency part. I can uh -huh. spend my time doing something more fun or instead of putting people into the CRM. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. My old firm used Money Tree, and it had this really nice table and chart where you could see like how much life insurance they needed each, depending on when someone died in the mm -hmm. timeline. Whereas Right Capital only gives you today, mm -hmm. and I want it's helpful to have that timeline when you're working with younger clients so that you can drop it off later, like know how long they need it. At all of yeah, that's a great point. Um, so. Agreed that so so the way I the way I approach that is like we don't know when you're gonna pass and your biggest risk is if you pass now right because your 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 net worth is gonna be heading in the right direction at least according to plan right you'll be saving and investing and debt will be going down slowly over time so like you're never gonna need more life insurance than you do now except if you have more kids 
um, or you take on more debt, right? So for my clients, like, and, and I'll talk to them through the mountain chart. So this is how I handle that situation as I tell them, like, um, you get to, you know, you don't need much life insurance at all, if any. When you graduate from college, you don't have any co-signed debt and no one's depending on you and you don't have a mortgage, right? And then you get to the point where you get married and maybe you have collective expenses that couldn't be easily covered by one partner um, alone, right? So then there's some sort of life insurance need. And then you have kids and then, you know, maybe you have a house and this is a very traditional path, right? So I'm not trying to say anything about this is the path that people need to take. I'm just trying to use this as an example, but um, and then you have kids and like to provide for the kids, both college and for expenses on an ongoing basis till they're out of the house, that adds life insurance need. So you get to this point where you get to like the peak of your life insurance need. And then from there, really every dollar that you save, invest or pay down in debt ultimately decreases your life insurance need over time. And so we will continue to rerun your life insurance needs so that we can decrease it over time. And sure, we're going to by, you know, I often will do a combination of 15, 20, and 30 year term just to make it easy for them to like save a little bit on premium and also understand that like we're going to drop these policies over time. And I'll let them know, I doubt you're going to need this first policy for 15 years. I, th I think that you'll probably be done with it in five because at the rate that things are going for you in your career and where your equity comp is headed, you likely won't need this coverage for that long, but right now you need it. Um, so that's how I explain it to a client. And I don't know if that helps at all. I don't know how much marginal benefit there would be in showing them, like, according to today, in 6.5 years, you can drop by 300,000. Because what I've learned from doing this this long is like, things never go according to like, life doesn't accord. It's like, guess what, we're having baby number four, or guess what, we're moving to Colorado from California, or guess what, I just got laid off, or guess what, I just had a million dollar windfall with equity comp that I wasn't expecting. Like, there's so many guess what's that it's, it's not, I, do, I don't find a marginal benefit in letting them know how it's going to change. I just give them the big picture that it's going to change and that we'll continue to figure it out as we go. And that seems to be enough. Kind of goes back to one thing we know about the financial plan is that it's probably wrong, but the process of financial planning is so darn valuable. Like that's what it's really all about is continuing to navigate and monitor. Totally. I always tell clients that what we're, what we're doing over time is we're building resilience and flexibility because we don't know which way life is going to take you. But if we can build resilience financially and flexibility financially, then you will be better able to handle whatever comes your way over time. And that all we can hold ourselves to is making the best decision with the set of information that you have at any given time and expecting the set of information to evolve over time, whether it's your needs and desires or your life or stuff that happens to you or macroeconomic stuff that you have no control over, like inflation and, you know, interest rates and um, the cost of homes and the stock market. Um, we just have to agree that all you can hold yourself to isn't being able to predict the future, but it is to be able to make the best set of decisions with the information that you have in the moment and then agreeing to evolve that over time. Mm -hmm. And um, I find that helpful for clients because it gives them context for it. Like I no longer panic that like, oh my gosh, if I redo their retirement calculation next year and it says they're not on track for what we said they're on track for, like, did I do a bad job or are they gonna be mad? It's like, no, that we, we did the best with the set of information that we had at the time and that set of information has changed. And when the inputs change, the outputs change. And we have to expect the inputs will change and evolve over time. Um, some of them, some of which we control, some of which we influence, some of which we have no, no say over whatsoever. And so that's why we plan over time. That's why this is a process over time and not just like a one-time thing. Okay, go ahead and do your thing. That was such a mic drop. That is going to be like the three minute snippet that I'm going to use for like short form because that was so good, Natalie. You're you're going to be tagged and bothered with that all over LinkedIn because that was so good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> well, we have five minutes left here. I have a plethora of questions, but want to make sure that everyone here uh, is is able to get their questions answered. So please feel free to either hop off mute and jump on in or uh, type it into the chat if you'd prefer me to read it off for you. Um, but want to create some space for anyone to ask questions here as we wrap up. And maybe in the meantime, I'll start off uh, with uh, one here, Natalie, that it's kind of an encompassing one. And 
especially speaks to our younger guests of maybe what you have, maybe what surprised you the most along this journey or what you wish, I guess it's really more of a two-pronged question, what you wish you knew when you were getting into the industry as mm. a, a young advisor. Okay, so what I wish I knew, and then you might have to remind me of the other prong um, yeah. after I do this one, but, and I'll try to be quick. Um, what I wish I knew when I got in, I think I had a sense for the kind of impact that I could have. I had no idea it was as big as it is um, in terms of the impact in people's lives. Um, but I think what I wish I knew was that, I think for the first, maybe maybe this is as a woman or, or maybe it's just because I was young, um, but I always felt like there are like rainmakers, right? Who bring in new clients. And then there's like the Doogie Hauser type behind them. That's like the the brains, right? And I always thought I'll be a great Doogie Hauser. Doogie Hauser is not a reference that y'all understand. Doogie Hauser was an old TV show of like this young doctor. Um, who's that famous actor? I feel like you would know the actor. He was in um, How I Met Your Mother. Oh, and he's the one. You know, Patrick was, Harris. Challenge accepted. Thank you. Neil Patrick Harris. Okay. Nice. Nice. So many, thank you. So many years ago, he was on a show. I said, I'd be short-winded and I'm just totally not. Um, we can go five minutes long if you can, or 10, whatever. He was like a, um, you're definitely not using this snippet, Colin. He was like a <laughs> like genius doctor, right? And, and, and his name was Doogie Hauser. Okay. So he, so that's how I always saw myself in the first 10 years. Cause I looked about 14. I look my age now cause I've had kids. But I used to not look my age. I used to look a lot younger than I was. And I started young. I was 23 or 22 when I started as a financial planner. Um, so I always envisioned, okay, I'm never going to be the rainmaker. I'm not going to be the like, oh, guess what? I know somebody who has a million dollars and they're going to want to be my client. But I can be the really smart one back in the office that like does a great job of all the analysis and takes care of the client and manages the assets and all those things. Um, I kind of wish I would have known that... Um, I was actually capable of the rainmaking side um, much more so than I ever thought. Um, and that it's so doesn't have to be salesy. It can just be like, sorry to be cheesy, but like it can just be expressing on the outside how much you love and care for people and how much you want to have a positive impact for them and learning about what they need and sharing what you do and figuring out if it's a match. And that's, that's it. That, that's all that it is. Right. Um, I had 40 new clients, 39 new clients in my first year of my RAA starting from scratch. And I have a 90% close ratio. Um, and it's not because I'm some salesy person. It's because I wear my heart forward and I deeply care about having a positive impact. And I want to work with people who are the right fit for what I do and who I'm ideally suited to serve. And if I can do a good job of discerning that and getting to know someone, um, and being their thought partner that like, I'm not the hero that like my job is to be their thought partner so they can feel great. Right. I'm not trying to be the friend anymore. That's like, oh my gosh, she's so smart. I'm trying to be the, the friend that's like, oh my gosh, she makes me feel amazing. I feel amazing after I get off the phone with her. I feel like I know what I'm doing. I feel like I have my act together. I feel like I have perspective. Right. And obviously we're not friends, we're advisors, but like, that's the person I want to be um, for my clients. And, and that's the most valuable thing that I can be for them. And I guess I wish I would have had a little bit more insight of, uh, I don't know that it's possible that I could have, but I guess that's a little bit of what would have been nice to know. What was the other prong? Natalie, another mic drop. Here we go again. That was so good. I really, that, that was, I got some goosebumps there. I, I was fired up. You're like, really get me inspired here. Oh, good. After um, my Doogie Hauser banter. You guys, I'm sorry. I'm from a different generation. <laughs> <laughs> right after that part. Okay. But we still got the, you know, as a group here, we still got the trivia question. Um, shout out to Jamie. Uh, the other question was, as uh, you've gone through this journey through different firms, you know, being able to impact lots of different technology companies, what through all of this has maybe surprised you the most? And where you've ended up today. Hmm. What has surprised me the most? Um, I think I've been most surprised about I, this is going to sound so weird. I think I've been most surprised about what I'm capable of. Um, I think when I started 
I had such a narrow view of what I was capable of, what my potential was that, um, and I, and I think, you know, through it, my career path was not strategic, right? I, I was gifted with opportunities and took, you know, took some open doors and um, certainly worked very hard, but there was no strategy. I didn't 18 years ago say, you know what, when I'm 41, I want to own a planning firm and I want to be head of advice for a fintech that I'm super excited about. There was, there was no, I didn't know what those things were when I was 23. Um, so I think the thing that has surprised me the most is the continued growth that I've gotten to experience in putting myself, continuing to put myself in situations that stretch me and grow me and being able to rise to those occasions and um, continue to learn and grow into some things that I didn't really think were possible before. I think that might be the most surprising thing for me. That is amazing. This has been such an incredible conversation, Natalie, and maybe the most inspiring one out of all the guests we've had. And especially too, when we think about building the next gen community and trying to lend a hand to new advisors, like you being a female advisor, which is a male dominated industry, and then also a consultant in technology, which in tech, not tech is also somewhat of a male dominated in industry with engineers. Yeah. Yeah. Being a total badass in both of them at the same time mm -hmm. is really, really inspiring. So um, I'm so excited to be able to continue to refer this video to our community and, and trying to really teach and inspire the next generation of advisors. So thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me. I love Next Gen. I was supposed to speak in Las Vegas this year and I couldn't because it was my kid's first day of school. And so oh, I declined it, but I'm hopeful that they invite me back so that I can be with the community in person because um, I'm well aged out of Next Gen now, but so passionate about um, about what Next Gen means um, for, for who our industry becomes. Um, and I love seeing um, women in this group and people of color in this group and, and the whole variety. So yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And best of luck with all future endeavors. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. So um, feel free to hop off. Natalie, I think we're going to stay, uh, stick around for five minutes here, kind of talk about the, the next uh, event here. Um, so thanks again for, for jumping on. Sounds good. Bye. I'm Bye -bye. the emoji that waves at the end of the Zoom, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We all do. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Woo, what a fun event, guys. I needed that. That was really special. She is a total badass. Thank you. I know Stephanie and I think Kimberly, maybe Rachel as well. I think Jamie, you also mentioned getting Natalie on here uh, was, was someone that we wanted to. Um, right when you guys tell me to like go try to find someone, I just like start my stalking approach and they like don't <laughs> see a comment. I just start commenting on their stuff and like <laughs> into the DMs and then we start following each other on Twitter and it's like, hey, thanks for the follow. Like little do they know I'm about to have a big ask. <laughs> like they, I would like to get her for Student Success Summit. I think she'd be really good. Oh yeah, she would be awesome. 